This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Well, continuing from where we left off in the last session, we now have to look at the impact of bonus issues and rights issues. And those will be the impacts on the share pool. A bonus issue and a rights issue simply means that the shareholder here, the corporate shareholder, acquires more shares directly from the company issuing those shares to you. If it's a bonus issue to you, there is no additional cost involved. You just get more shares. If it's a rights issue, well, sounds more sensible. This one, of course, for the issuing company, it is going to its existing shareholders in search of new equity capital and offering a great deal in terms of the rights issue and the price they'll have to pay for the extra shares. All we need to know is how to deal with those bonus issues and rights issues in terms of how they impact on the share pool. You're not going to see in the previous nine days prior to a disposal, you're not going to see that there was an acquisition of shares and then there was a bonus or a rights issue happening within those previous nine days. The bonus issue and rights issue is going to impact upon the share pool. How do they impact on the share pool? Well, from what you can see on the screen in front of you now, is what you have already read, you will know that in terms of a bonus issue, it is simply looking at the terms of the bonus issue. One for five, one for three, two for six, whatever it might be there. Whatever the terms are, we will have in our share pool at that point some existing shares in that company. So how many extra shares do we get? And whether it's a bonus or a rights issue, that means that we'd have those extra shares to go into the number of shares con. With a bonus issue, however, that is it. There is only more shares. There is no cost. And because neither the cost nor the index cost column is now changing as a result of the bonus issue, there is no re-indexation that occurs from the previous operative event. That's probably going to be an original or previous purchase through to the date of the bonus issue. We do not re-index to the date of the bonus issue there. Again, important rule because the examiner in his question is going to give you, no doubt, an indexation factor from, say, the original purchase or at least previous purchase up to the date of the bonus issue. You do not use that. You do not re-index to the date of the bonus issue. All you do, add in the extra number of shares to your number of shares column and then move on to the next operative event, be it a rights issue, be it an acquisition, be it a disposal, albeit to December 2017, where, of course, the last re-indexation of your index cost column will take place. And that is it. In terms of a rights issue, of course, well, that's just a bit more interesting in as much as for the shares that you acquire, you have to pay. So you have to work out not just how many shares have been acquired. I've got... Uh, 10,000 shares, the company has 10,000 shares in the share pool and has a one for four uh, bonus or rights issue. One for four on uh, 10,000 would I think be 2,500 shares. If it was a bonus issue, you just increase your shares by 2,500. So instead of 10, you've now got 12,500 shares. Job done, move on to the next relevant date. If it's a rights issue, then they will tell you how much you are paying for each of those shares. If you have to pay £3 per share for the rights issue shares, 2,500 times 3, that would be a cost of 7,500. That cost, of course, would go into both the cost column and the index cost column. And because you are now changing the cost figures, both the cost column and the index cost column. It means you treat a rights issue like you would any ordinary purchase of those shares, which means that before you add these shares in, you firstly re-index. To a rights issue date, you will re-index your current index cost figure, then add in the number of shares acquired and the cost of those shares 
to both the cost column and the index cost column. It's like any normal purchase. So much simpler and quicker and easier to deal with if it's a bonus issue, you just add in the extra shares, no re-indexation to the date of the bonus issue, and no change in the cost or index cost figures. Okay, with that in mind, therefore, let's have a little look at the examples that deal with this. Again, I suppose I'd better just go through the notes first, just in case you haven't looked at them quite recently. But a bonus issue, as we said, increases the number of shares held with no corresponding increase in cost. The bonus shares are simply added to the number of shares column in that share pool. Do not, however, index the cost. Do not index the cost of the original shares to the date of the bonus as no new cost is incurred. But remember on the next purchase or sale to index the index cost figure from the late from the date rather of the last indexation. Don't just look back to, oh, so when was the last shares going in? Oh, the bonus issue date was that. No, you re-index from the last date of any re-indexation. All the way through, of course, until December 17, if that comes before it. Uh, not the date. We do not re-index from the date of the bonus issue because there was no re-indexation at that date. We go back to the previous operative event before it and re-index all the way through to that next operative event after the bonus issue. With a rights issue, a rights issue again increases the number of shares held. But of course, now there is also a cost. How much are you paying per share for these shares? And it's therefore dealt with in the same way as any other acquisition. The index cost in the pool is indexed to the date of the rights issue. We then add in the right shares to the number of shares column and whatever is the associated cost of that, that cost is added to both the cost and the index cost columns. OK, now we'll have a little look here at example three. Calculate the gain on the disposal of the shares in March 2022. Y Limited sold 2,000 shares in March 22 for £12,000. So we know our sales proceeds. Where did they come from? We look to see are there any shares acquired on the same day, on the previous nine days or otherwise in the share pool. So what do we have? Y Limited had acquired these 3,000 shares in X Limited back in July 93. That's the starting point for your share pool. 3,000 shares costing £10,000. In February 95, X Limited made a one for three bonus issue. And there are no other further acquisitions. So what will that mean? It means that all of the shares now sold, these 2,000 shares, will come from the share pool. So we've got to construct that share pool, starting with the original acquisition. There's your number of shares, 3,000. There is the cost of those shares. And that cost also goes into your index cost column as well. The next date that is relevant to us is Feb 95 where there is a bonus issue there. A one for three bonus issue. Well, one for three on 3,000 is not something you probably need a calculator for. We'll get another 1,000 shares. But it's a bonus issue. So there is no re-indexation from when you bought the shares July 93 to the date of the bonus issue. No re-indexation. And we just add in the extra thousand shares that were acquired. That would simply mean that we now own 4,000 shares that still are deemed to cost 10,000 and have an index cost of 10,000. What's the next thing that happens? Well, the next operative event was the sale of the 2,000 shares in March 22 for that 12,000 pounds. Of course, between February 95 and March 2022, we have December 2017, the last date to which any re-indexation would take place. And the re-indexation here will go through to December 17, and it will be from 
the date of the original acquisition of the shares, July 93. So I'd like you, therefore, to now construct that share pool, starting with the acquisition in 93, adding in just the number of shares acquired under the bonus issue, then re-indexing your index cost figure, the original £10,000, that is, all the way through from the original acquisition date to December 17, and then deal with the disposal. How many shares do you at that date own? And how many are you now disposing of? And take out the relevant proportion of cost and index cost and feed them into the capital gains calculations as we saw before. So have a go at that one, please, and then I'll talk you through the answer to it. OK, let's say how we got on with example three, therefore. Now, what we originally did on just our read through was to determine that there were no acquisitions on the same day as the disposal, nor were there any within the previous nine days. So our only exercise involved is with the share pool. Set up our three columns as ever for that share pool. Kick it off with the original acquisition back in July 93. How many shares? What was the cost? And the same figure of 10,000 going into the index cost column. In February 95, we have a bonus issue. Bonus issue simply means you get more shares. One for three on 3,000, as we knew, was going to be another 1,000 shares. So all that's changed is you now have 4,000 shares with a cost of 10,000 and an index cost of 10,000. But that index cost goes back to the date of July 93. There was no re-indexation to the date of the bonus issue. Even though, as you see in the note there, the examiner is very likely to give you an indexation factor, in this example, from July 93 through to February 95, to see, well, again, it's that enough rope by which to hang yourself syndrome. Don't do it. No re-indexation. But we are therefore going to have to re-index that index cost total through to December 17, the last date at which re-indexation will take place. And that will occur from the date of the original acquisition, July 93. Our cost figure is 10,000, and it would appear that our indexation factor, as provided to us by the examiner, which it always will be, you've just simply got to pick out what is the correct indexation factor or factors to use, and then apply them. That therefore gives us a re-indexation figure in the index cost column of some £9,910. Add it in, which upgrades the index cost, as you can see there, to £19,910. Now we can deal with the sale with the disposal at that uh, date in, what was it, March 22 there. How many shares are being sold? 2,000. 2,000 shares out of a pool containing 4,000 shares. So with those 2,000, we take, we're selling half the shares, so we'll take half the cost and half the index cost, allowing us therefore then to do our calculation of the gain. We sold for 12,000. There is your cost of 5,000. Here is our indexation allowance calculation, the 9,955 index cost less the cost of 5,000. And that's the 4955, giving you a chargeable gain of 2045. Again, if this were either a Section A or Section B objective testing question, because you know that the index cost figure at 9,955 is less than the sales proceeds, all you will literally do at that point is pick your calculator up, put 12,000 into it, and then deduct 9955 to go directly to the £2,045 chargeable gain. We do not need to worry about presentation and layout and format of our answers. We just need to get the right answer. If it was section C, then the exercise as you see it here, with all of those workings, that is what you would produce there. OK, back to our notes, therefore. 
And what we also had to deal with was, of course, the situation of having a rights issue. And with a rights issue, of course, all we simply do is to add in the extra cost that would be involved. So with a rights issue, if I take you back to the answer to this, with our rights issue, if in February 95, that had been a rights issue, then the rights issue would have been one for three at how much something, some figure per share. That might have been, say, at four pounds per share. So in which case, you've still got a thousand shares coming in at four pounds per share. That would be another 4,000 going into both the cost and the index cost column. But before you put those amounts in for the bonus issue, before you add in the 1,000 shares with the cost of 4,000 and the index cost of 4,000, because it's a rights issue like any other operative event taking place before December 17, you would, between July 93 and February 95, you would re-index that original cost of 10,000 from July 93 all the way through to February 95 there. You would do a re-indexation, then add in the effect of the rights issue, just like any other normal purchase. The only difference here is that you've had to work out how many shares were bought and what was the cost of those shares, rather than just you bought this number of shares at that cost given in the question. But the technique is then exactly the same. There's no differences there at all. The remaining part of this lecture is the one recorded using Finance Act 2019. And the only new issue that comes into that in the context of dealing at least with corporate gains is the issue of takeovers. Again, if you have not recently looked at Chapter 13 and the rules that apply there to share transactions for individuals, takeovers is probably the most awkward bit that we had to deal with. So you may find it useful just to go back, revisit and think again through what we had to deal with there before embarking indeed on the next part of the study. But the Finance Act 2019 lecture to be used simply to begin with has a review of what we have done to date in terms of principally the construction of the share pool and dealing with acquisitions, rights issues, bonus issues, disposals there and of course the re-indexation of the share pool, but no later than December 17. So that's what you'll hear first. Again, a summary. Hopefully all of that you'll be able to listen to. Yep, know that, know that, know that, no problems. The new bit is takeovers, but what you're going to discover is we're simply applying the same rules and techniques as we applied when dealing with this same issue for individual shareholders. The only thing that has changed, of course, is indexation allowance. We have indexation factors supplied to us to compute indexation allowance and re-indexations of share pools that take place, at least up until December 17. And that's the only new bit. The only difference in terms of what you're looking at in front of you, the study notes for Finance Act 20, uh, where we have the example four and example five, is there's no difference in the narrative. The rules have not changed in a very, very long time, and nor are they likely to for the future either. But in example four and example five, we've got slightly different dates in terms of a disposal date and in terms of a takeover date. Given that both of these dates are post uh, December 17, as of course they are likely to be, then it makes no difference to the computations done. So although the dates will be different in question and answer, the construction of the answer and the financial outcomes are exactly the same. There is no difference there. So you can follow it through using your Finance Act 2020 notes. And just when you look at the lecture, you will see that the dates are basically a year on in terms of Finance Act 20 for the takeover date and for the disposal date. But as they are, as I said, both post-December 17, it makes no difference to any of the computations that you prepare. Okay, 
I can now take a back seat and hand you over to myself again a year ago and therefore deal with takeovers after, as I say, a little summary statement of what we've done so far. Well, so far in our study of corporate disposals of shares and securities, what we've seen is that we have slightly different rules of identification as compared to those applicable to the individual. And we've seen how those rules are applied in terms of acquisitions and subsequent disposals. Each acquisition is said to be, each disposal is said to be an operative event. And what that means is that that requires us to deal with a purchase of shares, a purchase of shares involving cost as an operative event, which means we re-index that share pool. Now, of course, the one time where we saw that cost was not involved in terms of a purchase of shares was through a bonus issue. So the three ways by which you could acquire shares in a company, you originally buy shares in a company that creates the share pool. You may then have a rights issue that you take advantage of. That further acquisition involves cost is an operative event. So what do we do from one operative event to another? From one transaction to another. Here, one purchase to another. We re-index the index cost column using, of course, the provided indexation factor. Now, that would happen when a rights issue followed an original purchase. Obviously, for a rights or a bonus issue to occur, there must have been an original purchase. But if we have a bonus issue, then we will simply add in the number of shares. We won't treat it like the normal operative event and therefore re-index. We just add in the additional shares that we've got. Remembering then that at the date of the next transaction, be it another acquisition or indeed, as previously seen, a disposal, then we must re-index all the way through from the previous transaction prior to the bonus issue, i.e. from the last time any indexation had occurred all the way through either to December 2017, of course, that's the latest we could go, if that is prior to the date of disposal, or of course to the date of disposal if that was prior to December 2017. So we've dealt with acquisitions through all the normal ways. We originally buy, we take advantage of a rights issue, and or are provided with a bonus issue. And we know how to record those transactions in the share pool in terms of number of shares, in terms of cost of shares, and where relevant in terms of the index cost of the shares, and how and where to re-index that index cost from one operative event to another. Culminating, of course, with the disposal. Now, when we have that disposal, it's always been this so-called expression we keep using there, operative event. And that, therefore, means that we are going to calculate a chargeable gain. Up to that date, or December 2017, if it were earlier, and for you it will be, we'll be dealing with a date of disposal sometime, no doubt, in terms of 2019, 2020, 2021, but something, a date, most definitely after December 17, that we will therefore re-index any share pool to December 2017 at the latest. We can't go any further than that. And that will allow us, therefore, to establish in relation to the disposal to set against its sales proceeds the amount of cost and the difference between the cost and the index cost column, the amount of indexation allowance, and thereby compute chargeable gain. But of course, as we had to deal with with individuals back in chapter 13, I think it was, where we dealt with share disposals for individuals, we may see a disposal that is somewhat different to the normal sale of shares. And that, of course, is a takeover. And takeovers, to begin with, as we look at them, as we did with individuals, these takeovers will be share for share, or if you want to call it this, paper for paper transactions. And as the note says here, where a takeover is a share for share deal, or paper for paper transaction, as it's also known, shareholders of the company taken over acquire shares in the acquiring company, the takeover company, 
And this normally does not constitute a chargeable disposal. There's no gain to compute at this particular point in time. And that happens because the new shares acquired, if you recall again the expression we used back in Chapter 13, the new shares acquired according to the terms of the takeover, they step into the shoes of the old shares. So if, for example, and here by the miracles of technology we have such a prepared example, if a company had owned shares in another company by the name of A Limited, and the shares had been acquired in A Limited by our client company, and we had acquired 10,000 shares at a cost of £100,000. Now, if of course that was just one original acquisition, then that too would be the index cost £100,000. Maybe that 10,000 shares was the result of two acquisitions. Maybe we originally bought 6,000 shares, we'd have recorded that cost and that same cost in the index cost column, and then we bought another 4,000 shares. That means that we would have re-indexed from the date of the original acquisition of 6,000 to the further acquisition of 4,000. And that means that we'd have a figure different to the 100,000 here in the index cost column. And what now happens at this point in time? Now we see a takeover. We have VPLC acquires the shares in A Limited, offering five shares in VPLC for each A Limited share. So the company that we are dealing with had originally bought 10,000 shares in A Limited at a cost of £100,000. Now the takeover occurs, and this takeover is entirely paper for paper. It is share for share. So no capital gain, no chargeable gain, is going to arise at this point in time. And instead, what happens, the new shares step into the shoes of the old shares. So all that happens is instead of having a share pool in the name of A Limited, we now have a share pool in the name of VPLC. Instead of having a number of shares of 10,000, that was the A-limited shares, what were the terms of the takeover? It offered five shares in VPLC for each A-limited share. Okay, 10,000 times five equals 50,000. So we've now got 50,000 VPLC shares deemed to have cost £100,000 and of course whatever index cost we had in our index cost column as well. Now that index cost will be to the late the previous, the date of the previous operative event there. Again what will happen here is that we will not have to re-index through to this date. In reality that is what would happen but we won't have to. What will happen is our examiner will give us an indexation factor that will run from the date of the last acquisition of any A limited shares held, not through to the date of takeover, though uh, again that's possible, but what we will do is to then look at the date of the sale of the VPLC shares. This takeover has not caused any gain to arise. It has merely changed what was a share pool for A Limited, with 10,000 shares costing £100,000, into a VPLC share pool where we have 50,000 shares costing £100,000. And again, whatever index cost, whether that's 100000 or something different to that, again, that would be provided to you. And what will happen is the real point of this exercise is it won't be the takeover that is occurring now. This will have occurred at some point in the past. But the question is likely to be asking, what happens when the company we are dealing with disposes of some or all of their shares in V? What happens when some or all of those shares are sold? We will know at that point, the question will tell us at that point, 
that those shares were sold for whatever figure of sales proceeds. It is always given the sales proceeds. So what you have to then do, of course, is to establish the cost and the indexation allowance. The cost will be simple. If it's all 50,000 shares subsequently sold, they have a cost of £100,000. To get, of course, our index cost figure here, that index cost, that would mean that we would need to re-index from the last time any indexation had occurred here, all the way through to, now I'd say, the date of the disposal of the VPLC shares, but pretty obviously that is happening now, now is much later than December 2017, so you will have an indexation factor. Again, if this was just a single acquisition there of 10,000 shares, from the date that those shares were acquired all the way through to December 2017. Remember, any indexation factors provided to you that are to date post-December 2017 are irrelevant. You are only concerned with indexation up to as a latest date, December 17. So that would be the issue. What therefore would be the chargeable gain when those VPLC shares are sold? You know the sales proceeds, you know the cost, and when you do your re-indexation of whatever is in that index cost column at the time of the takeover, you re-index from the last date of re-indexation all the way through to the date of either disposal or more likely here, as we keep saying, December 17, as that's going to be before that date of disposal. OK. Going back to our notes, therefore, that's the same issue as you saw with individuals. A takeover on a share for share basis does not represent a chargeable disposal. No gain arises. The new shares step into the shoes of the old shares. Those new shares, as we've just said, deemed to have been acquired for the same cost as the original shares. But normally what we get when we see a takeover is one that's a little bit more interesting than the one that I just gave to you there. Because a takeover may involve attributing the cost of the original holding, our £100,000 of a moment ago, to the different components, the different parts of the new holding. If, as is likely, a mix of consideration is received. Now, to begin with, that mix of consideration is going to be still in terms of shares. And the most likely mix with that we get is a combination of ordinary shares and preference shares. If cash is involved, that changes it. And that we deal with in part D. If cash is involved, again crystallizes and therefore again must be computed at that point of takeover. But if all we've got is still paper for paper, they're just two different types of paper, ordinary shares and preference shares, then there is still no chargeable gain to compute at this point in time. But of course, we have a problem. A moment ago, all of the cost of the A-limited shares, £100,000, became all of the cost of the VPLC shares. We just acquired one type of VPLC share. But what happens now if we were to have acquired shares in both VPLC as ordinary and also preference shares there? That £100,000 original cost of the A-limited shares now has to be split between the new shares acquired as a result of the takeover. And that is a very simple exercise because we divide out our original share cost according to the market values of the new shares acquired. And that's the point made here. How do we do it? By allocating the cost of the original holding, that in my example, a limited £100,000 cost, to the new shares according to the market value of what is received at the time of the takeover. Use the answer to example four below to see how the technique is applied. Well, we'll do that in a moment's time. But going back to my example here, 
we knew that we had originally acquired 10,000 shares in A Limited that bore that cost of £100,000. 10,000 shares, £100,000. If now we were to get both ordinary shares in VPLC and preference shares in VPLC, you firstly would have to work out how many such shares were required. So we had 10,000 shares in A Limited, then you'd be told for each such A Limited share, you received however many ordinary shares, however many preference shares. You would then be told at that date of takeover what those shares were worth. A price for ordinary shares, a price for preference shares, such as I said a moment ago, we will see an example for in a few minutes time. And what you would do with that information is to establish the open market value of each of those shareholdings. So we'd have had ordinaries, ordinary shares received in VPLC. We'd have had preference shares received in VPLC. And we knew it was based on 10,000 shares that we'd originally held in A Limited. So what might we be told here? We might be told that for every A Limited share held, you received six ordinary shares. And each of those ordinary shares were valued at five pounds per share. So you ended up with 60,000 ordinary shares in V, each worth five pounds, therefore in, to oops, in total worth 300,000 pounds. And then the preference shares. We might be told there that we got 10 preference shares for each A limited share held, and that each of those shares were then valued at two pounds per share. 10,000 times 10, 100,000, at two pounds per share, 200,000 pounds. So what we had received from VPLC was a takeover package that was worth £500,000, made up of £300,000 worth of ordinary shares in VPLC and £200,000 worth of preference shares in VPLC. And having got that information, what did we do with it? Well, what we did with it, which I hope you remember from chapter 13, was to use these market values here as a basis for splitting out your original share cost. Your A limited shares had cost 100,000. We're now going to split those on a ratio of three to two, i.e. 60% of that cost to the ordinaries and 40% there through to the preference shares. That therefore would have meant 60,000 of the £100,000 cost was allocated to the ordinary shares and 40000 was allocated to the preference shares. And then at some point now in, whether it's 2019, 2020 or 2021, at some point now, a disposal takes place, either of some or all of the ordinary shares or some or all of the preference shares. And you will be told when that took place, 2019, 2020, 2021, as we said, and how much those shares were sold for. So what you now had to do was to work out a cost and an indexation allowance. So you now know if you sold half of those ordinary shares there, half of those ordinary shares, then all of them had a cost of 60,000, half would have a cost of £30,000. And what we then need to do, of course, is to establish the indexation allowance. And all we have to do here is simply apply a given indexation factor, which will be from the A limited shareholding, the last time any re-indexation, if any, had occurred within its share pool, all the way through to what would be, because it would be an earlier date, 
December 2017 as compared to the later date of disposal. You'd be given that indexation factor and you'd simply apply that to your allowable cost. Remember your allowable cost was if we sold half of those ordinary shares, half of that 60,000, 30,000 pounds. And in that way, you would get your indexation allowance and then you could compute your chargeable gain. Okay, let's just go back again to the notes. It said there, use the answer to example four below to see how the technique is applied. Well, let's see whether we, some from me, a lot from you, I hope here, are able to deal with this. And as example four has asked us to do here, we've been able to calculate the gain arising as a result of the takeover in July 19 and the sale of the BPLC preference shares in March 2021. Now, of course, as long as the takeover is share for share, there will be no gain that crystallizes in July 2019. All we'll have is a gain on the eventual sale of the BPLC preference shares. That taking place in March 2021 there. So what's the backdrop to here, the sale of the BPLC preference shares? We're told that the company we're dealing with is Z Limited. And Z Limited originally acquired 10,000 A Limited shares in August 1989 at a cost of 10,000 pounds one original acquisition in August 89, 10,000 A limited shares cost 10,000 pounds. In July 2019, BPLC takes over A limited. For each share in A limited, Z limited receives. We get two BPLC ordinary shares valued at one pound 50 each. And also for each A limited share held, one BPLC preference share valued at one pound each. So what I need you to do now is to put together our little working as we did a moment ago, whereby you will list out the open market values of the ordinaries and the preference shares received. Going from the original shareholding how many new shares did you get for each old share held? And what were they then worth at the date of the takeover? Record those market values, then use your original shareholding cost to be then allocated between the ordinaries and the preference now received based on those market values. We use the market values as the basis for splitting the cost of the original shares between the two types of share now acquired. Once we've then got the share costs, that will allow us to deal with an eventual disposal. But what I want you to do at the moment here is to repeat this exercise that you see in front of you now for this particular example here. We'll then go on to look at what happens the preference shares being sold in March 21 for 15,000. And as we said, as will be provided to you by the examiner, we then told the indexation factor that the index rise from August 89, that was when you originally bought the shares in A Limited, and no other shares had been acquired, there'd be no operative events, new acquisitions or disposal, so no re-indexation of that original cost would ever have occurred. And we're told that the index rise from August 89 through to December 17 is 1.357. Now, of course, they might also offer, as we've done in so many of the previous questions here, an indexation factor that uh, again would go through all the way to the date of disposal, March 2021. We don't care about that. We know that indexation here can only go as far as December 17. But do this bit here first, please. So pause at this point and then we'll see what we do with that information and eventually compute that gain. So pause at this point and then once you've done the working, 
come back to me and we'll move to the next part. OK, let's see how we fared, therefore. Again, establishing how many BPLC ordinary and preference shares that we will have acquired and what they were then worth. That's the key, getting the market value of the new shares acquired and using those market values to split out the original cost of your original shares. So our original shares, we held 10,000. We got two ordinaries and one preference. Each of the ordinaries worth £1.50 at that date, each of the preference shares just £1. So market values of respectively 30 and 10, total 40,000. Therefore, 30 fortieths and 10 fortieths, three quarters and one quarter respectively, of the original total cost of your original shareholding is now allocated to each of your new shares, your ordinaries and your preference shares. And as we said, as the terms of the takeover are a share for share transfer, no gain will arise at the time of the takeover with the new shares in BPLC taking on the same original cost as the old shares in A Limited there. So what we do is to split that original cost according to the market values. As two types of share are issued at takeover, we use the market values of those shares as the basis of dividing out the A Limited share cost. Hence, the ordinary shares take 30 fortieths, the preference shares take 10 fortieths of the share cost, and those are the figures, as I say, that we've got there. Again, a point that won't be an issue for you, but in reality, the same method of apportioning the index cost column of the A limited shares would be applied, and re-indexation of the index cost column would occur. The time of takeover or to December 17, well, December 17 is the most likely one there, that would happen. But what you're going to get, as provided here, would be an indexation factor running from the last time the original shares had been re-indexed all the way through, well, in this case, to the first disposal of the first new shares acquired as a result of the takeover. They were the preference shares. So we've then got to calculate the gain on the sale of the preference shares. So what are we told back in the question? The preference shares sold in March 21 for £15,000. There's our proceeds. We'll now be able to use, oops, we'll now be able to use the information here, of course, to establish what was that cost. All of those preference shares are being sold, so all of that cost of £2,000 is now deducted. We have an indexation factor that taken us from when we have bought our original shares through to, as it's a date earlier than this sale, December 2017, and we apply that indexation factor to our allowable cost, the £2,500. Deduct it to then derive the chargeable gain. If we had to go on and deal with a disposal also of those ordinary shares, then you know from that calculation there that their cost, when sold, will be 7500 And again, any such disposal will require indexation allowance, but that will only go to December 2017. Okay, now just going back to our note, what we have is the situation from points A through to C dealt with, where because the terms of the takeover were purely paper, it was a share for share deal. It doesn't matter if there's different types of share, we've seen how to deal with that. That's the most likely question you're gonna get anyway. But what happens if some component of what you received was in the form of cash? If at takeover cash is received, then a chargeable gain will need to be calculated at the date of takeover for the cash element received, and for that we'll see example five. If you receive cash, you are making a gain, HMRC are gonna tax you on that gain. So this time at the point of takeover, based on the amount of cash you have received, there will be a need to compute a gain. So what we might see, looking now to example five, is using 
the information we had in example four, what difference would it make if Z Limited receives at takeover, as we had before, two BPLC ordinary shares valued at £1.50? That is exactly the same as we had before. But instead of, as it was here, one preference share valued at one pound each instead what we get oops instead what we get here is one pound cash for each share in a limited and we're then told that the index rise between august 89 and december 17 on this occasion there is why it should have been different actually because it's the same one but not to worry, we'll just use that particular number. It should be the same figure as we had before there. Uh, just an updating issue. So what do we do? First of all, as you would at the point of any takeover, you list out the open market values of what you have received. Here, ordinary shares and cash. You do those calculations you get the total market value. You then use that information to split out what was your original share cost. Remember your original share cost, Z had bought 10,000 A limited shares for 10,000 pounds. So that figure in there will be 10,000. How will you split that 10,000 between the ordinaries and the cash? according to those market values. And once you've got the amount of cost that is attributable to that cash received, there's your sales proceeds, there's your cost. All you've got to do is then apply indexation, index that cost figure and derive your chargeable gain. So to begin with, just do this working here. List out the market values of what you've received. You'll see it comes to the same numbers as we've just seen in example four, but this time the mix is ordinary shares and cash rather than ordinary shares and preference shares. And as we keep saying, because you receive cash, there is now a gain to be computed at the point of takeover. You therefore will split the cost of your original shares according to those market values and whatever cost then is attributed to the cash, use it in computing a gain. But again, pause at this point while you do that little working and then see whether you can go on and work out that gain. I'll take you through that in a moment's time. Okay, let's see how we fared therefore. As we've said, because we now receive some cash at the time of the takeover, then an immediate gain will arise and is computed as follows. To be able to calculate that gain, you knew that you had cash received of 10,000. You work that through there for each of your 10,000 shares held in the original company, you got one pound cash. You also, of course, ended up with 30,000 pounds worth of ordinary shares in uh, BPLC. Those, just to remind you, were valued at one pound 50. So you therefore would have had 10,000 times two was 20,000 BPLC ordinary shares that were valued at one pound 50. That equaled 30,000 pounds. So the same numbers as we had before, total value of 40,000, Original share cost 10, split 30 fortieths and 10 fortieths respectively. That gives us costs of seven and a half and two and a half attributable to the ordinary shares and the cash. But because it is cash, we now have an immediate gain to compute. You know your sales proceeds, you know your cost, those fit in therefore to your gains calculation. And all you need to compute is an indexation allowance based on a given indexation factor. Again, sorry about the fact that's a different indexation factor to that which we used in uh, example four there. Even though the dates are the same, we index through to December 17 because that's prior to either the date of takeover or the eventual sale of what well, in example four was the preference shares. But you're given that figure apply it to your allowable cost, get your indexation, 
deducted get chargeable gain. Remember, of course, that if the indexation allowance took you from a gain into a negative, I won't use the word loss, but into a negative situation, indexation allowance can't create a loss. All it can do is to reduce an unindexed gain down to nil. Indexation allowance can never either increase a loss or create a loss. And so therefore, we've been able now to compute the gain. So you should now be able to deal with uh, share disposals, share transactions, where we're dealing with transactions made either by an individual, as in chapter 12, or now by a company. Now again, you could see these transactions tested in the section B question, where on capital gains we'll have, there's a scenario and here's five requirements set. But of course, this would also lend itself to a section A objective testing question. Remember, whenever you do a capital gains problem, the first thing that you do is to look at who is making the disposal. Who's doing the selling there? Are we talking about an individual? Are we talking about a company? Because different rules apply in terms of computing the gains, as we've just seen. Companies get indexation allowance, individuals do not there. In terms of shares, different rules, different identification rules, so far as companies are concerned, as compared to individuals. So always, on any question that you get, it will be an objective testing question, whether it's section A or section B, make sure you've firstly determined who's doing the selling. Is it an individual? Is it a company? then follow the relevant rules. Now, of course, we've got more relevant rules to look at in terms of disposals by companies. Again, our next chapter, chapter 20, that we'll go through too. Um, most of what we do there, again, is based on the rules of capital gains that we saw back in chapter 12 for individuals. And the areas that I want you to go back and revise before next time, before we look at chapter 20, you go back to chapter 12 and you revise the issues of part disposals. Other than shares, it's usually land. You bought 100 hectares of land. You then sell 40 hectares. Once again, you know what you sell them for. Your problem is the cost. Look at part disposals. Look at chattels again. Remember that £6,000 chattel exemption limit and how it applied. Again, usually tested whereby one or other of the figures of cost or sales proceeds is above the £6,000 chattel exemption limit. The other figure is below. Also look at the non-chattel, non-chattel wasting assets, things like copyrights we'd have seen. Go back and revise those rules because those rules are going to apply equally in chapter 20. But of course, in computing any gain, we'll also have to deal with indexation allowance being available to companies that was not, of course, applicable to individuals. OK, we look forward, therefore, to seeing you next in chapter 20.